Well, next up, it's a great pleasure for Draper Goran Holm to welcome back the Securities and Exchange Commissioner, Hester Pierce, alongside Jordan French of the Daily Grit News as they explore the SEC's current thought process. Well, this session will be followed by a panel of industry experts assembled by Onera's Ami Ben David to chat private market tokenization. Welcome, everyone. Jordan French here with Grit Daily News. Welcome to LA Blockchain Summit. Big shout out to Draper Corn Home, Jay, and the rest of the team on the back end. They'll never get enough credit uh, for what they do. I'm here with none other than SEC, that's uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, Commissioner uh, Hester Purse. Hester, welcome to LA Blockchain Summit. Jordan, thanks for having me. It's, it's a delight to be part of the LA Blockchain Summit, even if it has to be remote. Um, and I, as you know, as a former regulatory attorney at, a, at, at FERC, um, I have to give my SEC disclaimer, which is that my views represent my own views and not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. That's exactly what we want is your, is your personal views, uh, unfiltered, unadulterated. Uh, you know, Hester. But I, I got a lot of questions, actually, just, just before even this talk started. Uh, you know, and, and I think it'd be helpful, especially for the uninitiated, if we could lay some foundation of, you know, what is the SEC's mandate, uh, you know, today, especially as it relates to, you know, cryptocurrencies and perhaps even NFTs that be, have become a considerable marketplace, uh, Hester? Well, that's a big question. Um, the SEC is a big agency. It's, it's got about 4,500 people spread all over the United States. And our mandate, which dates back to the 1930s, is to um, protect investors, of course, facilitate capital formation, which means help um, build an environment in which companies can raise money and grow, and um, foster the integrity of the markets, so fair, orderly, and efficient markets. And so what does that mean? That means in practice that we regulate the stock markets, we regulate broker dealers, investment advisors, um, and we regulate the market infrastructure entities. Uh, and we also oversee disclosures by public companies. So it is a big, a big mandate. And, and then crypto came along um, and that fits within different places in that mandate. A lot of the attention has been on um, initial coin offerings and whether those are essentially securities offerings, which is something that we regulate. Uh, but there are also questions around um, whether platforms and, and professionals that interact with crypto, whether those things, uh, those entities might fall within our jurisdiction. Um, you raised NFTs. That's a very complicated and, and very fast changing area. So I will give which is that um, NFTs, um, certainly if you, if, if you are designing an NFT platform or you're designing NFTs, you should be thinking about whether or not they're securities. If you fractionalize something and sell pieces of it, that could be a security. Um, and perhaps uh, it, NFTs could be securities as well, depending on how they're designed. So um, that's that's not very helpful, but I think as with a lot of these things, and I'm sure we'll get into this as we talk further, the facts and circumstances really do matter and you have to be careful because you can easily trip over securities laws or other federal and state financial regulation. Certainly, and, and it is helpful. You, you did, um, you know, you mentioned the word securities and we'll set that aside and we'll, we'll get right back to that. That'll dominate a lot of this conversation. I'm excited for it. But one thing you also mentioned, though, is protecting investors. Uh, you know, it's it's effectively part of the mandate. Uh, it's in all sorts of language. And it just sounds also like a slippery slope, almost like to what extent uh, do you protect? Because uh, there's plenty of downside, right? There's plenty of downside in stocks. To, uh, stock The stock market, for example, which, you know, that was contemplated, certainly, right, when, um, you know, when the SEC was formed. Uh, again, we know that these are your personal views. W where does that line end uh, in your mind, Hester? Well, I really like that question because I think often people just look at that part of our mandate, the protecting investors part of our mandate, and they see it, you know, sort of, well, it's an obvious, it's like motherhood and apple pie. Of course, you want to protect investors. 
But that can mean a lot of different things. So one important way that we protect investors is by ensuring that they have disclosure so that they can make their own decisions. Um, and we also, you know, as I said, we regulate financial professionals. And so we're, we're looking to make sure that those financial professionals are behaving um, with respect to their, their clients and customers in, in ways that are, that are protective of those clients and customers. But at the same time, it can be very easy for a regulatory agency like ours to, to start to think about some of the things that you mentioned, you know, protecting people from the downside, making sure people don't take risks that they shouldn't take. Um, and that really is not our job. Our job is, is to empower the investor. Um, but also, from my perspective, it's really important that we maximize opportunities for investors. And so that means making sure that competitors who have new ideas with for, for new products and services can come into the securities market and offer those products and services, uh, making sure that companies that want to go out and raise capital, that investors are able to participate in those, in those capital raises, are able to be part of building those companies. Um, so I view investor protection as a, as a really, um, you know, multi-layered concept where, yes, you're trying to protect investors against fraud and fraudulent actors, but you're also trying to protect their ability to participate in the markets and to be part of such an important piece of, of the fundamental uh, building blocks of our economy. Certainly, and 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 a lot we could un, unpack there um, in the commissioner purse. But on this, um, uh, we'll move back uh, securities back into the into sort of our 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 sort of main view here. And uh, it, it's worth already asking, you know, what if something is not a security? Uh, the there's been this question uh, about certain cryptocurrencies. They've been traded. How they've been, you know the sort of their genesis. Um, there'll I, there will be an ICO, which is a bit of a dirty word now, and we can get back to that in a bit. Um, but some didn't go that way; they just sort of like started to float in some way. And and I think you know where I'm going. They look like commodities. If something isn't a security, what ha what happens to it from a regulatory standpoint, uh, Commissioner Pierce? So that that brings me to our sister agency, which is the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And the CFTC, as it's known, is the regulator of the derivatives market. So we're unusual in the United States. We have this bifurcation where we have the SEC regulating the securities markets, the CFTC regulating um, futures and other types of derivatives. And so that is um, sometimes leads to to places where we our jurisdiction might overlap or might come. You know, there's some gray areas. Does it fit within the CFTC's ju jurisdiction or does it fit within the SEC's jurisdiction? Uh, but if you're talking about a uh, commodity and there's a derivative like a future built on top of it. So you have Bitcoin futures and you have futures based on ETH. Um, those those futures products are regulated by the CFTC. Now, the CFTC can look through to the underlying commodity market. Um, a lot of what the CFTC does is it, its origin was in commodities uh, or derivatives based on agricultural commodities. And then over time, that sort of expanded into um, a lot of financial commodities. And, and so these are financial derivatives. Um, but now, you know, we see crypto derivatives as well. So the CFTC can look through to the underlying market to police fraud and manipulation type things, but it, it's not the regulator of the commodities markets. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that to my colleagues there. Don Stump, uh, who's a commissioner over there, did a really nice explainer of what the CFTC's jurisdiction is, and I commend people to take a look at that so they get a sense of what that's about. So it is not really clear, um, again, what depending on, on what you're looking at around around a an asset that has been deemed to be a commodity, you have to you have to assess whether or not the CFTC would be the regulator. And if not, depending on what the activity is, there might be some other regulator that would have jurisdiction over that. 
Yep, and you, and you explain uh, you know regulatory overlap. Uh, you know, and to the extent that we can we can try to clarify this for people. I'm going to read this back to you. You know, I think futures related, especially if there's you know Bitcoin futures, an example that you uh, uh, that you offered up. That's what the CFTC. That's who you know folks who go to if there's a complaint issue or you know maybe a new issuance, uh, for example. Uh, and the underlying could have overlap by both of this, both the CFTC and the SEC. Let me know if I got that wrong, uh, you know, Hester. Well, and, and I would say other agencies could be involved too uh, around the underlying. And so, um, query whether the SEC would have. Again, it depends on the facts and circumstances, and I don't want to talk about any particular digital asset. Right. Um, the SEC could potentially have have jurisdiction over something related to the underlying asset, but there could be other regulators, non-financial regulators at the federal level who might have um, something to say about that. There could be state regulators that might have something to say about that, which right, is, no, I think, no. one of, go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, exactly. We've certainly seen some some enforcement actions out there. Uh, the first one that comes to mind, South Carolina has been a relatively active, active regulator i think a few other states have have issued enforcement actions and and just just to just unpack that so the answer is coming from you um uh, how how do the states uh how do the states fit into this well again this whole landscape is developing a bit so i think we should distinguish between two things one is regulation so day-to-day -day regulation of activity um and and the second is enforcement and sometimes someone who doesn't have day-to-day -day regulatory authority as the, as you know, I was talking about the CFTC with the commodity markets, they don't have day-to-day -day regulatory authority, but they might be able to bring an enforcement action. And so similarly, you might see um, states coming in or the SEC coming in um, with enforcement action. So you can have a lot of different players on the enforcement side. Now, one of the other things about the United States, and let me bring it back to securities where I'm more familiar, that's my area. Um, so we have the SEC at the federal level, but state securities regulators have been very important regulators in this, in this space um, for a long time. And so we share authority over the securities markets with our state regulatory counterparts. Um, and then on the shifting away from securities again for a moment, on the crypto side, the states are involved um, through regulating money transmission. So there's another spot where states can come in. So it's definitely a confusing landscape. And that's why a lot of people in the space find they need to, to go talk to at least one lawyer and maybe multiple with different specialties uh, to figure out where what they're trying to do will fit within that regulatory regime. Yeah, it's it's. I'm very bullish on the uh, on the legal market here. Uh, certainly, hearing this in this Hester, but perhaps for for good reason. There are some real, uh, there are some very real risks. And and one thing I want to drill down on, because uh, we'll we'll touch on a couple other you know really cool issues, including some of the talks that you've given recently, uh, and Wild West analogies. People know that's coming, but it's drilling down on the the currency side, uh, you know, of crypto, you know, and how how that fits in. Uh, it, broadly, from a pedestrian uh, standpoint, uh, Hester, uh, a fiat currency like the U.S. dollar, perhaps Canadian dollars, and or you know Euro dollars, they might be all looked at differently. Um, but those don't seem to be you know necessarily securities. Yet a lot of the cryptocurrencies call themselves com uh, currencies, you know, and perhaps even. Uh, uh, obliquely in competition, right, with U.S. dollars, and certainly investors see uh, see them that way. Uh, is that something that you could also unpack uh, for us? Perhaps uh, you know your views on the currency aspect of cryptocurrencies, and to the extent that they should be regulated by the SEC. Well, it's difficult to talk about cryptocurrencies all with a one blanket term because different crypto is used for different things, intended for different things. Um, certainly some people are using certain cryptos as, certain crypto assets as currencies, as ways to transact with one another, to, to pass value from one person to another. Um, 
it is difficult to, to, you know, again, take a blanket approach and say, well, this is how the securities laws apply to those circumstances, because you can have something that someone is treating as a currency, but we would nevertheless consider that to be a security. Um, so it, it it is, again, really necessary that you look at the facts and circumstances that you think about those in light of the securities laws. Um, I think there's some really interesting there's some really interesting developments in the crypto space now around stable coins. A lot of people talk about stable coins as being a potential alternative, more American approach uh, to a digital currency than a than a central bank digital currency because this would allow for competition and it would allow for um, protecting people's information from from being financial information from being viewed by the government. So there are a lot of a lot of fun conversations around that. Uh, many of those are really outside of my purview as a securities regulator, but it has been uh, really interesting to watch the developments in that space. And certainly, you know, and, and dare I say, it sounds like, you know, again, these are your personal views. That you encourage this this type of innovation, Esther. Yeah, so certainly I think one of the one of the really wonderful things about this country is that it has always been a place where people want to come and build things and and that innovation which you know stems back to the very beginning of the of the country um has has really powered our prosperity and our growth and so innovation is really important now one thing that can happen and i think is it's one of the things i'm worried is happening on the security side is that when you get a regulatory system that's pretty well developed and you have players who have been in that regulatory system for a long time, you can end up with a situation where both the regulator and the, 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 the big players are comfortable with that situation. And they're not really that excited about new entrants coming in or people coming in and saying, hey, we might want to do this in a different way. We might want to try something new. We might want to build a new product. So it can be very difficult to open the regulatory barriers so that people can try new things. And so that's one of the one of the concerns that I have here at the SEC is that we make sure that we keep our securities markets dynamic, that we allow for new competitors to come in. Of course, we're going to have regulatory um, constraints on what they do, but those regulatory constraints should be limited um, and should should be flexible enough that people can achieve the objective of the regulation but do so in ways that are that are more appropriate for the new technology or the new product so that's something that we really need to make sure that we keep that regulatory flexibility so that we keep the dynamism and that dynamism is what makes the the us a good place for people to come and innovate Certainly sounds like, you know, part B, the mandate, not just protecting investors, but perhaps, um, you know, give some, it sounds like, just to read this back to you, give some breathing room, uh, you know, to those who, who do innovate. Uh, just to repeat this back to you as well, is, is like a really pedestrian analogy, almost truly pedestrian, uh, is, you know, an example of a, an Uber or a Lyft. You know, everyone knows of the uh, the sort of entrenched competitor that's the taxi lobby and and um, it's instinctive for them to to go to politicians to stifle that competition. So um, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience will be, uh, are, you know, are keen to hear this from you and um, and are encouraged by it. And I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is that often the attempts to protect protect the the existing status quo are are couched in terms of investor protection. And so we have to be able to do the hard work of sorting through where are there real investor protection concerns and where are these investor protection concerns being raised in an attempt to try to just make sure no change ever happens. And that can be difficult, right? And so I think people who are trying to do the right thing um, can come to that discussion and have different views on that. But that's why we really need to have these conversations we need to have some push and pull at the regulatory level and also in broader society as we're talking about these things to determine what the right regulatory framework is. 
certainly in 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 commissioner purse consider uh, you know you mentioned the regulatory framework and you know finding where that is i think practically anyone in the audience would agree that's important uh, nonetheless there does appear to be uh, you know some daylight be between you uh, you know at least one other uh, of the commissioners and I'll go to something that everyone in this audience is anticipating, and that's the sort of Wild West analogy or, or metaphor, rather, uh, you know, that Gary Gensler brought up. You also brought it up in uh, your own speech, perhaps counterbalancing it. And just to unpack that for everyone who's maybe a, a bit uninitiated, uh, it's it's this sort of evocation that um, uh, the cryptocurrency, you know, sort of universe is, it, you know, is chaotic. It's it's the Wild West of vigilantes doing what they will uh and certainly there's uh, probably some uh some credence to it uh that you might concede we'd love to hear your views uh you know on how much uh people should put stock into that analogy and perhaps the contrasting viewpoint that people romanticize uh you know the wild west is one of the most popular uh you know film allegories out there certainly plot arcs and a lot of it had to do with what being American uh, was. Uh, Hester, your take. Well, so I, I did want to counter uh, Chair Gensler and, and others. I mean, he's one of many who just use this Wild West terminology to suggest it's just a mess out there and we need to come in. The, the government needs to ride in and impose some law and everyone will be better off. And, you know, I think we tend to just throw throw those words around. And I wanted to say, well, OK, let's look at what what it was actually what was the West about? And it was a bit romanticized. I agree with that as well. But there is this notion of people leaving the staid societies on the on the East Coast and looking West to this broad, beautiful country and looking at what they could do there and um, building civilizations in under really difficult circumstances. But but building, you know, really impressive civilizations there and cities and and then, um, you know, innovation hubs. And, and so let's not forget that other side of the story. That's what I wanted to do with that speech. Um, now, again, you mentioned that there there is some daylight between me and, and maybe what some of my colleagues think. I do commend people um, to read a recent speech by by my colleague, Commissioner Crenshaw, who did address digital assets. Uh, it was a speech earlier this month to get a different view. But I think it's important that we're at least having this conversation. And that's why I wanted to, to push back a little bit on this, on this notion that just because something doesn't have a, a very intense government regulatory framework, it doesn't mean that there aren't other self-regulatory types of frameworks that evolve and that and that can actually serve people quite well. Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and, you know, the, the natural question to ask is, you know, how do you resolve those differences? Uh, and forgive me, I'll ask a compound question just for the sake of time to get it to you. And there are a few things that you've proposed. Uh, you know, we could have any commissioner on at, you know, at this summit or the next one, but you're here with us. We'd love to hear what your proposals are, uh, if you could unpack them for us. Uh, thanks, Esther. Well, so what what I've proposed uh, is a safe harbor for token distribution events. So when someone is trying, when a project is is ready to launch its network and wants to have broad use of that network, how can it get the tokens out in a way that's compliant with the securities laws, but also achieves the the goal of getting people using this network? Um, can be it can be tricky as we've seen under the securities laws, and so. Um, the safe harbor approach that I've that I've put forth would address some of the concerns around are people who are buying these tokens getting the information they need to make wise decisions about whether to buy the tokens. Um, balances that with the idea that the projects really do need to move forward, and so it lays out some disclosures that these projects would have to make, and then at the end of a three-year period, the idea is that if the network is decentralized or if the, the token is really, you can show that it's it's a utility token, you could move on outside of the securities framework. Um, so that's one, one thing. I, I would like to work on some of the other many outstanding issues there are around custody, for example. I think we need to do a better job to 
provide some guidance for people who want to be involved in this space, particularly regulated entities, what they need to be thinking about around custody. Um, but I do welcome people to come in and talk to me about that issue and about other issues where they need clarity um, so I can start thinking about what a framework might look look like. Again, it may not be the framework that ultimately gets adopted, but I think it will at least get people thinking. Certainly. And we'll set that aside because you just offered everyone to, to contact you if they had ideas or proposals of how to, uh, you know, how to address certain issues. And we'll get to that towards the end. Um, uh, on, on, you know, just sort of the br broad daylight issue, just inspecting some of the inner workings between commissioners, how do you uh, resolve, uh, how, what, what are the mechanisms to resolve issues and, and sort of close the gap so that you can do something that perhaps is fair, but also everyone agrees may, maybe it makes sense to do something in response to an action. So this kind of brings me to, to a question that you asked me um, in the lead up to this conversation, which is, is there something about the SEC that people don't know? And, and this really brings to mind something that I think a lot of people don't know. The five, there are five commissioners at the SEC. Chair Gensler is the chair. He's one of the five. Um, and so there's a, a law that says we can't all just get in a room and talk about things behind closed doors. We can either have a public meeting um, with all of us, or we have to, we can have closed, so-called closed meetings when it relates to enforcement actions. Um, those, those we can have behind closed doors, but there are rules around how that has to happen. So that does make it difficult for us just all to go out to lunch and say, hammer out a safe harbor framework. We can't do that. We can work through our, through our um, people who, who work in our offices and we can work on a, a bilateral, you know, one, two of us can go and talk about something. Um, but I think that's why these conversations sometimes play out over a longer time period. Now, the chairman of the commission does have a fair amount of authority. He has authority over the staff and also has agenda authority. And so the key, I think, is to get something around crypto on the agenda so that it can be on the rulemaking agenda so that we can actually talk about building a framework. Uh, Chair Gensler has been very um, vocal about crypto and, and specifically has, has said to people, come on in and talk to us and we can talk about what adjustments need to be made in the regulatory framework. I think my concern is that a lot of our, our outward facing activity has really been through enforcement. And that is not a good way to build a regulatory agenda because then you're, you're looking backward and you're punishing people um, for what they did in the past, as opposed to saying, look, we realize there's some ambiguity here. We realize there's some gray areas. And rather than, then, of course, there are times when you do have to look back. If there's fraud, absolutely, no, no doubt. But if we're really trying to build a good regulatory framework so that people can use it and can do what they're trying to do, but do so in a way that's consistent with our laws, why don't we focus our energy on that? And then when people violate it, then of course there'll be there'll be enforcement um, consequences. So that's that's one of the tensions right now is that I think we've we've led with our enforcement foot. I'd like to see us leading with our regulatory foot, which would be a much more collaborative pro project um, involving all of the commissioners and and the commission staff as well. And so just to drill down then on then that specifically, um, I think we all know what an enforcement action looks like. And you're you're just just to repeat this back to you, you're teaching in the other direction. What what does regulatory action uh, uh, look like to, to people and you know to the public? So it can look like a couple things. One, you can have informal regulatory action, which would be some people have seen that in this space, a no action letter where someone comes in and says, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. I'll adhere to these conditions. Will you let me do it? And the staff that usually the staff, it can be the commission, but usually the staff says, yep, if you do it just as you said you would, we won't bring an enforcement action. But sort of the, pre and, and then we have exemptive orders as well, where we can say, you know what, you're going to be exempt from the rule if you do it according to these conditions. The preferable way and the way we typically do rule writing is through a notice and comment process where we'll actually put out a proposal. And we'll say, this is what we're planning to do. Public, come tell us what's good about it, what's bad about it, what you would do differently. 
And then we take all of that public commentary into account and we write a final rule, we give an implementation period, and then people are off to the races. They, they know what they have to do. And, um, and so there's, there's often communication with the agency during that implementation period as people say, hey, you know, I have a question about this and we'll come back with responses to those questions. But that's, that's the way rules are typically written. And I think it would be wonderful to see something like that um, in the crypto space. And certainly in this audience, you know, listening intently, uh, they're hanging on the words uh, public comment in the interest of time. Uh, Esther, um, how can people issue, uh, sort of uh, get you a public comment or, or reach you in that capacity to, to contribute to you know, potential frameworks, at least or ideas uh, in furtherance of them? People should feel free to reach out to me, commissionerpurse at sec.gov. And then also I, I should um, mention that FinHub is, is our staff level entry point um, for people who have specific projects or questions that they want um, to discuss with the SEC staff. Yep, that's FinHub. And you heard heard the email address earlier. That's all the time that we have. Uh, big round of applause for uh, Commissioner Purse for joining us uh, from the SEC. Uh, from the HQ, we see in the background. I'm Jordan French with Grip Daily. Uh, thanks again to LA Blockchain Summit for putting all this together. Thanks for your for your time, Esther. I know you got a lot of work uh, ahead of you, and it sounds like you'll see at least some public comments uh, from this audience. Appreciate Perfect. it. Thanks Until so much. Time.